Welcome back. Well, today I am talking to Trailblazers, and my next guest broke barriers by becoming the first black female principal ballerina in the history of the American Ballet Theater. From her first ballet lesson on a basketball court to dancing on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House, Misty Copeland's sharing who paved the way for her success and those that she says will change the future in her new beautiful book. Let me tell you, it's called Black Ballerinas. Please welcome the one and only inspiration that is Misty Copeland. <laughs> I see you, I expect you to twirl. <laughs> I, I, when I see her on red carpets, I expect her to twirl down the red carpet. It's incredible to have you in studio. It's so wonderful to see you and to, to be here with all of you. So the last time we spoke, we were on virtual Zoom. We, yes. I was in my home doing the show. You were on location. Yes. And you were trying to keep young ballerinas inspired through your virtual platform. Yes, yes. And now we're in person. How does it feel? It feels amazing. You know, I, it was such a difficult time for everyone yeah. going through this pandemic, going through, you know, this racial reckoning. Yeah. Um, but I feel like it was this beautiful silver lining for the ballet community. Mm. There's never been a moment in my 20 year professional career that I've seen um, any true acknowledgement of um, the lack of diversity. These are the conversations I've been having my whole career, and I've never really seen any true impact in the way that I have in the last year and a half. And I feel like it was a moment for us to step back, take a look at the ballet community, and really address the things that needed to be changed in, in kind of collaboration with what was happening in the world. It was, I think, a beautiful moment for the mm. dance community. It's interesting you talk about discussing it behind the scenes but not in front of everyone else. So this was, it seems in many ways, and the same thing with my industry, kind of a family business that was being discussed, but not open. Mm -hmm. When you brought it to the forefront that yes, Misty Copeland, the first back, black ballerina to accomplish this, is behind the scenes fighting yes. to bring this to the forefront. How did it feel to finally be able to say it out loud? Like, I'm not back here being silent. I'm fighting yeah. the good fight. <laughs> you just don't know that I am. Yeah, you know, I don't know that I've been that quiet about it. <laughs> well, no, you have not. But, but, but yes. in the passionate way that we Absolutely. saw after George Floyd's Absolutely. assassination. I feel like that, mo that time was a moment for me to kind of pass the torch to the next generation, mm -hmm. to feel that they were empowered enough uh, to have a voice. Because I think that's something that so many dancers of color shy away from because they don't want it to hurt their, their right. careers. Um, and that's something that I guess I've taken a risk with throughout my career, having the conversations, but doing it in a way where I felt um, it was going to be constructive. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a dialogue. And though it's not always fair for the person on the other end um, to have to hold back their emotions because they don't want to be seen as weak and not given another opportunity or to be seen as aggressive or, you know, all we talk about is race. But um, I found a way to navigate in a way that worked for me, but I feel like in this this last year and a half, it's been a moment for me to kind of step back and say, and empower the next generation to Inter feel comfortable speaking. Interesting you say that because you have been strategic in discussing race, not because it wasn't front of mind, but as you know, if you want people to receive your message, yes. the delivery does matter. Yes. And you hit on a note that I've heard people say often, and we anybody who's of color have heard, all you talk about is race. <laughs> when people have said that to you, and I know they have implied it even on social media, what's mm -hmm. your response to that? If you don't see me as a black woman, then you don't see me. Mm. And um, it's... It's to, not, it's to not acknowledge the experiences I've had and the yeah. struggles that I have day in and day out. Like, I've had these conversations, you know, even with my artistic director at American Ballet Theater, where uh, I, I've said, you know, I've had to work 10 times harder than a lot of the girls next to me. 
And in his mind, he was like, do you truly believe that? Were you in the studio more hours? And I said, you know, that work isn't always sweat equity. <laughs> that work is the daily obstacles that people who aren't of color don't understand how we have to navigate in a world that's not accepting us. Right. And that is the work. And to not, to not acknowledge my race, um, even if I'm a principal dancer, it's doing a disservice to the entire right. ballet community, the entire black community. Yeah. There's no way I can I, I can exist and speak and not yeah. talk about that. You can't, you're, oh, you got me every time. <laughs> Um, because to your point, I mean, I remember doing an, uh, an event once and they said, well, should we take out the Today Show? And I said, no, I was the first black woman to host the Today Show. That I earned. Yes. And I'm not taking that away from anybody. Absolutely. You know, and, and that's a part of that daily thing when you say, and the reason why I teared up, I'll be very transparent, I hear it from black women all the time. We work 10 times harder and we have to prove ourselves. And then when somebody retorts, oh, are you sure you do? You're like, no, I'm certain I yeah. do. And you have to say it in this yes. way that it's received as non-threatening. Right. There was a point where you wanted to quit. Yeah. And I think people understand why, you know, mm -hmm. the pressure of it mm -hmm. all. When you look back at that, that moment, how did, you, how did you keep going? The reason that I'm here in this position are these women in this book, are so many women that I stand on the shoulders of, but an incredible support system that I had around me. Um, Arthur Mitchell being one of them, who is the founder of Dance Theater of Harlem, mm -hmm. the first black principal dancer at a uh, New York City ballet. Um, and he actually started Dance Theater of Harlem after the assassination of Martin Luther King. He mm -hmm. was like, I have a bigger purpose. And I feel so connected to him, and he was a mentor of mine, but, um, there were just so many moments, you know, I spent the first 10 years of my career, the only black woman at American Ballet Theater. Mm. And, um, you know, I just had so many moments where I was like, am I doing the right thing? Is this really the path for me? Will I ever persevere? Will I ever make it, um, you know, to soloist? Will I ever be promoted to principal dancer? And Arthur Mitchell was like, well, come on over here to Dance Theater of Harlem. I don't understand what the problem is. <laughs> you know, you'll be surrounded yeah. by people who look like you. You will have a support system. Yeah. Like, these issues you're having won't even be an issue. Yeah. And I went over there. He offered me a soloist contract. And I hearing his words, and I know he wouldn't want to hear this, um, but uh, hearing his words gave me motivation to want to go back to ABT and fight harder. Wow. I felt like what he had created in Dance Theater of Harlem has done so much for the ballet community and so much for the black community and so much for the world. And I felt like I had a, a similar duty to do that in a white space right. and to be a presence in that space mm -hmm. so that people could, in, could see themselves that we don't have to just exist in a, in a company where it's just us, mm -hmm. that we have the right to, to persevere and succeed in a- to succeed in any room, any, in any room, room, in any space. Well, I know we have a video message from someone who never let you quit, and she's drawn inspiration from you since the day you met her, when you were 13 years old. Take a look. Hi, Misty. From the first day I began teaching you, when you came off the bleachers at the Boys and Girls Club, I knew I had come across the biggest talent I'd seen in my life. You inspired me every day with your dedication. My proudest moment is when the world watched you dance and they fell in love. When little girls walk in with such confidence and belonging, you paved that path. You are truly an inspiration, and you are still that big heart and beautiful soul, and I love you. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's Cynthia Bradley. That was my first ballet teacher who saw, I don't know what she saw in me, oh. this little raggedy girl from <laughs> San Pedro, California, that like had never yeah. experienced anything. And you know, I was so shy and introverted, and she yeah. pulled so much out of me. Um, and I lived with her and her family. She took me into her home and, um, and gave me so much opportunity. Yeah. So that means so much it to does. her. You know, I'll tell you, um, a friend of mine called me this weekend over the Halloween and she's, she happens to be white in Jersey and her niece proudly was Misty Copeland walking around <laughs> in the Jersey neighborhood. And so your, your reach we know goes beyond 
black ballerinas. It, when you were on the show the last time, there were four little girls, happened to be yeah. white, and they're like, their whole dream was to meet Misty Copeland on the show. So this legacy is so powerful, but it does mean something more yeah. to black people and people of color. And this book, Black Ballerinas, My Journey to Our Legacy, yes. is what you've called your most important work. Yes, it is. Um, you know, it's been my life's work. I think that there have been moments in my career where I never saw myself, and this is not to, to take a dig at any ballerina who's danced well into their 50s, and there's so many throughout history that, like, have have their purpose to do that. And I've always felt that the stage was never the end goal for me, mm -hmm. that there was always something more that I was supposed to be doing. And this book is definitely proof of part mm -hmm. of what that is. And I think that being in my position, having my reach, having this platform, it is to tell the stories of so many black yeah. ballerinas in particular, not just black dancers and not black male dancers, but black ballerinas whose histories are not documented. You can't open up a history book and, and find out about these dancers. Um, and it's very different, and I've been saying this, but it's not the same as an Alvin Ailey. You know, people say, well, we, we see black dancers on the stage, we see Alvin Ailey. Those are modern dancers. Yeah. Those are not classically trained dancers yeah. where the space is so close to black women. Mm. And so I feel that it's my duty to begin to tell the stories. Yeah. This is no, not a comprehensive list. These are 27 ballet dancers that I selected that have impacted my life. Yeah. And it's really through my lens, me sharing how they have contri contributed to ballet history yeah. and that our legacies are important to be told. And it's not just for black little black girls. This is for anyone, I think, who has curiosity and wants to know more about their own culture and their own community, but also for people to do more research and, and add to the list. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you. Congratulations on Thank it. You. I know you also have the production company. Yes. So to your point, <laughs> It doesn't end at the stage. Mm -hmm. Your branch is extending worldwide. Thank you so Thank much. You. We appreciate you being on.